So week three, it's already week three, guys. It's amazing how quickly uh, time really flies by. We're one quarter of the way through, if you look at it that way. We have uh, this week, we're going to be doing school age. We're going to be doing adolescence. There is a quiz at the end of class, and it's a lot on last week's information, okay? A lot of information that um, has to do with, you know, toddlers and infants and um, information that's been covered. So let's see how we can recall that. Um, we know that the exam, first one is next week. I did the review myself, and I know that all the everything you need to be successful is in your PowerPoints, and it's in your Cahoots, and it's in the exam review. Those are the three things that you should be focusing on, okay? Now, you will, as I said, get your first review later on today when Dr. Gullett sends it to me. And she does a great review. She's very thorough, um, and it flows easy with her. So many students love listening to her. So um, I would suggest to listen to her review. Mine is tomorrow at two o'clock. And again, it will be recorded. And as I said, it's gonna be in one place. You can see how I put your cahoots together. You could see how I organized even just the announcement for you because I'm trying to help you in those ways that I possibly can. So again, today we're gonna to do what? We're gonna do a PowerPoint then we're gonna be doing a cahoots. Uh, when we are done, we do have your quiz too that we will be covering. If you need a 10 minute break to review last week's information before the cahoots, I can give that to you. If you want it, yes or no, that you, you know, whatever you tell me, okay? Will so, it be on the cahoots, like from last week's stuff or it's gonna be at this week's stuff? It is not all on the cahoots. It is not all in the cahoots. You know, all the information, some's in the reading, some's in the PowerPoints. Um, so you'd have to go back and look at your infant toddler um, PowerPoints. And there's some great information in there, okay? All right, let's go ahead. Let's start with your first. PowerPoint for today, which is now talking about school age children. You know, school age children are uh, what I did my research on. You know, the attitudes and behaviors of school age children towards injections. I feel that children have been scared, uh, really afraid and scared of injections and needles. As in the Spanish population, the kids go, no pinche, no pinche. You know, they don't want that shot is what they're saying. Um, and some kids are never afraid and I wanted to know why. So that was my dissertation. So I'm very familiar with school age. <clears throat> school age, ages six to 12, it's a really long time. They start out as baby faces and grow up to be mature, almost teenagers by the time they're done. It starts with at six years old where their baby teeth start falling out and it ends with all of their permanent teeth in. So that's a lot of growth and development we're doing. Now, because it's six years, it's gradual. You know, they gradually grow taller, they gain weight um, and they start bec stop becoming, you know, more baby and more needy into being more independent as the end of school age. As I said, you know, it is that um, growth that's smaller. So two inches a year through the whole six to 12, they will gain one to two feet. But again, that is what we say is six years. So it's not a much per year. Um, their weight, two to three kilograms and over six to 12, their weight will double. And boys or girls in the end are about the same. All of a sudden you see in adolescence, the boys will get taller, bigger and heavier than the girls. And that's when you start with puberty. So their movements are a lot more graceful. They're, you know, able to, to do things like, you know, ballet and look graceful. Um, They're playing sports and not as clumsy and able to hit the ball and kick the ball type things and run faster. Their skeletal muscles get longer and now their fat's going away. They're starting to get to the point where they're gonna be curvy as they get into their um, puberty and into adolescence. 
they have more muscle because there's less fat, right? And then their head, we've been talking about their head and their chest and all that. There's just really no relationship to that now. And as I said, they start with a baby face and they end up with more of a grown up kid by the end of school age. And we know that age of the loose teeth is age six. Now my grandson is age six. So I'm really waiting for him to come to my house, lose a tooth so I can play Tooth Fairy again. I haven't played it in a long, long time. So it's gonna be fun watching the teeth fall out. I'll take pictures for you. Now their body systems start to mature as in they need to urinate a lot, especially on trips, the younger kids, I gotta go pee pee, gotta go pee pee. You have to stop, stop, stop. As now they're getting older, they can hold their urine longer, you know, and they can wait to go to the bathroom, whereas younger kids, they can't. Their heart used to fill their chest a little more. Now it becomes in more proportion and smaller. They've had many colds, many illnesses. Their immune system is better. Plus they've had all of these immunizations. I mean, two, four, six months, 12 months, 15 months, two years, four years, six years. It's like, immunization after immunization. So their immune system is good. When they're small, their bones are more pliable, like I said, like the skull, you know, you have a flat head, but if you put them on tummy time, that flatness will go away just in those little bit of time during the day that you have them off their bellies. But one thing that we have to be sure of in this age group is don't look at what the child looks like. You have eight and 10 year olds that look like adolescents. Make sure you know the age when you're talking to them. So physical maturity does not correlate with, you know, their emotional or social maturity. And that is a common mistake. Now, one thing that happens with children and it might be subtle, a child that starts to have behavioral changes with physical symptoms like they could be very klutzy now and they never were before. Or now you start seeing them with stomach pains or diarrhea. This might be that sign of distress. They may not tell you. And, you know, I think teachers um, see this a lot. And if you ever go into school nursing, that would be something that you'd say, something go on at home you need to talk about because it could be that stress or maybe it's a bully at school, who knows? but you will see behavioral changes with physical symptoms. And that is the stress, stress, something's going on. Now at the end of school age, you see this prepubescent, usually about ages 10, uh, where girls start puberty. And then it's two years later, boys. Do you remember being in fifth grade as a girl? And then you, you're sort of getting interested in boys because you're getting more mature, right? And the boys are just silly and stupid. I still remember, oh yeah, he's stupid. I, you know, I don't like him because they're not as mature because they haven't gone through puberty. So it's two years difference. And then of course they catch up and then they get taller and bigger, et cetera. And then of course we like them again. Now, how do you assess a child? Again, get on their level, get down on their level. Don't tower over them. I love sitting next to them or on the floor on a chair next to them. So I'm actually looking up at the child. They love that even the best. So make sure you're on their developmental level. You've broken the ice. You know, they are not fe fearing you anymore. And for instance, let's say you have a child who comes in and is sick. Maybe it was a cough and maybe fever. And we're thinking maybe it's pneumonia. Well, we need to do an x-ray. Now, if you tell a six-year-old, especially boys, you tell them they need an x-ray, all they can see is guns with radiation zapping you and putting holes through you. I mean, that's what a kid might think. So just say it's a camera. It's going to take a picture, but we can see your insides. And what I always did, even pneumonias, broken bones, anything, I would show them the picture. And they would go, oh, Look at that, and then it becomes fun. So if they ever have another x-ray and the nurse says, yeah, you're gonna have an x-ray, let's go, they're not gonna be afraid because I've already told them it's a picture they're inside, I've already shown it to them. So uh, that's one thing, a trick I've done and it works well. When you look at a kid, it's that inspection. You could tell a kid, is he well or is he sick? 
absolutely just by looking at them. You know, a kid that's running around is not that sick, but a kid who's just sitting there listless, hmm, something's going on. Then you'll auscultate, percuss, and you'll palpate, you know, whether it's the abdomen or whatnot. Last week, we talked about lymph nodes and lymph nodes, you shouldn't see them unless they are sick. And then part of the assessment as we go into a complete assessment would be the cranial nerves. So how do we test the hypoglossal nerve on anybody? Even babies will do this, how they stick their tongue out. You know, babies are imitators, right? You stick your tongue out and you'll see, they'll try to do it. And it's the cutest little thing. I said, look, the kid's sticking her tongue out at me already. And they're only, you know, one month old and they will at that age. Also, children have different breath sounds than adults because they have a lot of upper airway mucus all the time. I mean, kids always have a runny nose, always a little mucus, always a little cough. That's just because they're always, as I said, swapping spit between the other kids, right? They're always with a little bit of something going on. That's what kids do. And it's okay. That's how they build immune systems. Now, if we listen to the lungs, we might hear noise. It could be ronchi, it could be rails. But if we listen to just the trachea, okay, which is bronchial lung sounds, we're gonna hear all that upper airway stuff. And we know if we have the kid blow the nose and cough, all of those secretions could disappear. So we know it's not the lungs that have a problem, it's just all of this nasal, nasal mucus, okay? Now, Freud. Freud is all about things that have to do with sex, right? Well, when we talk about Freud and the school age children, it's all about same sex peers. They don't, girls don't have boys usually. I'm not saying always, but it's usually same sex peers. And this latency period is boys like their moms and girls like their dads. That's what latency means. It's this big term. That's all that means. Now, Erickson, one of the most important theorists, I think, that I try to incorporate in any care that I do for these children. A sense of industry, an industry, <laughs> what does that mean? No, it's not a building, an organization, a company. It's a task they do well. Do they cook well? Do they play the piano well? Do they run around the fastest? Are they the best on their softball, baseball team? Or are that kid that spells the best or is the best at math? Because you have kids that all do something well. That is a sense of industry. So when we are giving a child, a school-age child, a task, we want to make sure that they can accomplish it or they're going to feel inferior because everything else they can't do well, they feel bad. They feel inferior. They want to do everything well and they want to feel good. I did that and I did it well. They want that praise because, wow, you were the fastest runner today or wow, your math has really gotten good or whatever it is, okay? So industry is a task they do well and everything else they can't do well is that inferiority. Now, Piaget, they're starting to think more uh, logically. They're starting to understand things that younger kids didn't. You know, give two younger children, preschoolers, a glass of milk, and one is in a tall, skinny glass, and one's in a short, fat glass. Well, the one with a short, fat glass says, hey, you got more than I got. But if you pour them into each other, it's the same amount. And that's what we call conservation. Or a big piece of clay. You smush it, it's still the same size clay, all right? And we're going to go into some of that. <clears throat> and they're starting to understand more and think a little bit more about making, you know, decisions or, you know, judgments against things. Like, is this good? Is this bad? Well, what have I seen in the past? Because now they have, you know, a memory base to think about. And, of course, classification skills. You know, how many boys have every Paw Patrol, everything in the world? That's all of, you know, that thing they like. Or maybe they're collecting pennies of all different years or seashells from the uh, uh, seashore, right? I mean, they have these classifications and they love to collect. This is what I was saying about the cognitive development and conservation. 
it's the same thing, whether it's in the same pattern or if it's not in the same pattern, it's still the same amount. It's just differently presented. Now, when we talk about concrete operational, um, we, this is your younger school age children. You know, um, again, they're understanding that conservation, like I said, but the sociocentricity. Mom is sitting on the couch, not feeling well. And then the kid goes and gets a blanket and covers mom and says, here you are, mom. They can see you're not feeling good. I know when I have some flares and sometimes I hurt, especially my left knee sometimes, the pain gets crazy. At that age, still, my grandson will come over and kiss my knee and tell me it's all better. It's that understanding that somebody hurts and empathizing with that pain. Now, formal operation is the end stage. It's the last stage of Piaget. And they can figure stuff out to make things work. So it's a logical, method methodical way. I use the example of, you know, mom said I couldn't go to the movies this weekend because of whatever. <clears throat> well, what if I take the garbage out without her asking and I make my bed and put the laundry away and get A's on my two tests this week? She might say yes. So logically thinking, what can I do to get what I want, right? Or working your way out of a situation. And they'll figure out many different ways to get there. Now, Kohlberg still is that morality. It's right and it's wrong. Now, the younger kids are the reward and punishment still. You know, if you're good, I'll give you a chocolate if you eat your dinner, whatever. Or um, you'll be able to play a little bit more on your tablet if you're good. Now, the older kids, ages 7 to 12, they want to please other. They want to do right. They, they know and they're willing to conform to the rules because they want to be known as good kids. Spiritual development. You know, remember, you've got to know what your spirituality is in order to, order to understand somebody else's. Now, in children, they need it concrete. They need to know um, why there's a Christmas tree or why there's a manger there. Somebody just had a hand up. You know, who was that? Okay, I'll keep going. Sorry, so, that was me. Okay, do you have a question? Um, we're from Mrs. Morris's class. Is there a way we can get your PowerPoint that you're using for this? Sure can. Hold on. You're having issues with the internet up there right now? Yeah, she cut, uh, she cut out real quick. We thought okay. we were going to at least get halfway through. No problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post it in the chat box. How does that sound? Yeah, she warned me it could happen. Sounds good, thank you. Not a problem. You know, I never mind anybody stopping me. You know that, guys. You need something, I'm here to help. Doesn't hurt. We work together as a team. And that's what nursing's all about. Thank you. It's not an I, it's a we. Okay, mm, how else can I do this? What class are you in? What's the number of it? It is, let me see, we are on Wednesday. You are in section seven. All right. I'm going to send it in the announcements right now. Okay. Does that work? Because I have to close it to open it. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. No problem. See, I'm sort of acting like that formal operations in Piaget, right? figuring out how do I get students what they need and having constraints. It's the same type of thing that your adolescents do. Almost there. Don't you love how the internet is like so fast when you need it? And then <laughs> I laugh all the time. Some days I'm zooming by and some days not. And I've got two boosters in this house. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. If you're sending it in announcements, is that going to go into your class announcements? No, or... yours, in yours. Okay, 
I have access to everybody. Since I am lead, I have everybody's. There you go. It's coming through right now. There you are. Yep, you have think- it. Okay. Yeah. No, you're very welcome. That's what you call teamwork. All right, here we are. So we are on spiritual development now. We're only a couple of slides down already. So in spiritual development, you know, children need concrete understanding and they will ask questions and they have a desire to learn who God is. Just like the preschoolers, like super ego conscience starts. It's almost like them understanding, you know, who is God? Somebody bigger than them that can punish them, right? Now, children in school age, especially the younger ones, think they're going to be punished when they've done something wrong. Um, And they think that, you know, whether it's an illness, an injury, it's God did this to me because I hit my sister or I didn't do well at the, on my exam today and mommy's upset or I didn't take the garbage out. Now, the one way that I use this in my practice as a nurse is I know many young kids uh, have appendix and they need to go right to surgery. And we know the younger children, number one, are afraid if you cut them open, you bleed and your insides are fall out. That's one thing. The other thing is they believe that they were punished by God. So before they go to surgery and I worked in the emergency room, I would say, listen, just going to have a little bit of hole. He's going to look in there and pull it out a piece of tissue you don't need it so let's get rid of it okay and it won't bother you anymore and I'll make sure I tell them to put extra stitch there so nothing's gonna fall out and I said listen you didn't do anything wrong it wasn't that you hit your sister you didn't do well on your exam it just happens so don't feel like you did anything wrong <clears throat> I want you to know that these children you can see a change in their demeanor it's like their shoulders drop it's like They're not afraid anymore. And they go into surgery with a better feeling, don't they? Because they didn't do anything wrong and they're going to be okay. And it makes a difference. Now, social development, we know school age children are all about same sex peers. Uh, Part of the discussion question this uh, week is all about, you know, two kids wanting to do soccer or baseball and they're going to switch for the other kid. It's not uncommon. They like to um, be with their peers. Um, They like that praising from them. It's a great relationship for it. We also know that these peers are those children where they start to get some independence away from the parents, whether they start going to each other's house or they're talking to each other or, you know, playing together. They, you know, talking about all different things. So they're now starting to break away from home. Because the goal is by the end of adolescence, they're either going to go to college out of the house or they're going to eventually move out of the house and get married, right? So we're preparing them for that. And it starts with a same sex peer. Clubs and peer organization, it's another great organization, but parents need to be involved with understanding what's going on during these um, clubs, et cetera, because there's bullies, always a bully. You know, let's say you're in Girl Scouts and you're going to make a cake and everybody would bring in an ingredient and you forgot and you didn't bring the butter and you can't make the cake. Everybody's like, oh, man, you know, you always mess things up as bullying. So being there as a parent is very important. We know that the parents, the family, you know, we know the constant in their life is always their family. And we know they assume the um, behaviors, values, cultures, personality of the family. As they get into relationships, they're going to assume some of theirs too, right? That's part of that independence. And parents don't need to be the kid's friend. They need to be a parent and have those, you know, rules and that routine that needs to be followed. Now play. You're going to play to the day you die. I mean, I play with a little computer game on my phone you know, word thing. I I love playing it. You know, you always play, right? 
children, making sure that they're playing age appropriate games is important. As younger kids, it teaches them rules and rituals, how to follow it because they get off into going to work. Don't they have to follow the rules of their boss and of their job? So they're preparing them by paying, playing you know, these games. It teaches them how to play as a team, you know, with other children, other adults as they get older. And of course, learning how to be by themselves and play by themselves. And this ego master, mastery is that feeling good about themselves. That's the industry, feeling good that, you know, those tasks that they accomplish with Ericsson, right? Industry is, um, they feel good about it. And that's part of their ego. They're starting to be aware, like, you know, Erickson talks about, and, you know, those um, industry is they're starting to be aware of their ability, values, and their appearance. They're starting to see that some kid's skin is brown, some has freckles, some has glasses, hearing aids. You know, one kid is short, tall, fat, skinny, really kids smart, really smart at uh, adding or reading. They're starting to see this. They're being aware. Younger, they don't really get that. And we know that all adults that touches your child in any way has an inexperience, whether it's in sports, Sunday school, or school, or you know any other uh, activity they're in, can really positively affect them, as in giving them the guidance um, and that praise that they do need. Because we know a kid who feels good, that their self-concept is good, they're gonna be these really happy kids. They're gonna feel very secure about themselves and they're gonna have a lot of respect for themselves. Now, body image goes even further in adolescence, but in school age, they start to like dress to be cool now. You know, they're not just gonna put whatever mom wants on them. They want their dresses to be good. They want their bows in their hair. You know, they understand what color eyes they have. Well, I've got pretty blue eyes or I've got these big eyelashes. They're starting to see these things. And like, they know, yeah, I know. I got pretty blue eyes, yes. Yes, I've got big eyelashes, yes. They're starting to understand it. <clears throat> and they're, of course, as I said, they're starting to understand differences in children. Like, why is that kid push me? They don't understand when I tell them no. It could be a child that has, maybe Down syndrome, then they don't see it, okay? Or maybe they didn't hear because they have a hearing aid or they didn't see because they have, you know, strong glasses. So when they go into kindergarten, they have gone away from all of the play, daycare, play, preschool, play, you know, less work is done there. And now they have to sit there, um, focus a lot longer and they have to do this work to learn the colors and the alphabet and you know the numbers etc so this is a sharp break away from what they're used to it is now their second socialization place they have home and they have school this is where they are most of the time and then they're going to be around a lot of kids different kids different religion religions different cultures um, so they're going to start learning those things in school. And of course, same-sex peer relationships are becoming more and more important because they don't understand, they talk between each other and they come up with you know, a decision. I'll always say it, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Most important thing that a child gets, you know, nutrition is important. We know that today, even in a two house, uh, uh, two um, parent household, both need to work in order to make ends meet. So fast food, quick things for dinner, is not uncommon, especially if you're working and going to school. It is what it is. So fast food can happen, and you know it could uh, lead to not getting proper nutrition, also um, gaining weight because of the extra calories. School age children are a great age to teach. You know, uh, my kids in uh, the school age were taught dare to keep kids off drugs. Now they're doing a lot about nutrition. And even, you know, the school systems are 
trying to give better nutritious meals for breakfast and lunch. Um, so they're starting to learn. And then there's this app called My Plate. And My Plate talks about the food groups and if they're getting the proper uh, food groups during the day. <clears throat> now, today, school age children, obesity is reaching epidemic proportions because why? Well, a lot of kids don't go outside to play. It could be because of neighborhoods. Well, that's not their fault, but it could be due to that. But they're sitting home, they're playing on their phones, computers, you know, we've got these new games coming out all the time. You know, Switch just came out. Of course, my six-year-old grandson had to have it, you know, and you worry that all they're gonna do is sit there and play, 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 play. They need to get up, get out and run. You know, every day, you know, my grandson comes, all right, you have some computer time? Sure, it's fine. There's things that you learn from that. But come on, let's go ride your bike. Let's get your scooter. Let's go. You know, and we'll go running around the neighborhood and doing whatever. And, and that's a healthy balance. Of course, he's this skinny, though. <laughs> so he hasn't gained any weight. But there are children who need it. My older grandsons, they're pudgy. So now they are, and they're quite pudgy. They are put into football. So they're my younger grandson that's up north in North Florida, um, he is a tackle and he's a big tackle. We know that over eight children have an increased risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol because what happens is there's these cardiometabolic changes in their body from being overweight. So we know that it's no boundaries in what culture, you know, or ethnicity um, uh, overweight can happen. We know that education can prevent a lot of things. So how do we you know, address this? Well, we address it from the very beginning, you know, at conception, during a prenatal period, they should be you know, fed properly, the, the mother. And then of course, as infants are growing so quickly. As I said, it's every ethnic group, there's not just one. And we know that targeting school age children will catch them in time. And the other thing that you know I see all the time is that children in school age, because now they're old enough to understand, can't get up off the table till they finish everything on their plate. And what are we teaching them? To eat till you're too full, right? They should eat to a certain amount and they should not have to eat the whole thing if you know they're full already. But of course, now they're getting no snack unless they finish, but um, that can lead to obesity. They're still sleeping a lot. They still need nine to 11 hours. We know the younger kids, six, seven, eight, are gonna have a hard time going to sleep, you know, bedtime routines. You know, I need another glass of water. I have to go to the bathroom. I wanna kiss daddy. Here, give me another hug, read me another book. I mean, they could go on and on, you know, really prolonging bedtime. The older kids, when they're ready, they just get up and go. They're just tired. They don't have to go through that routine. Again, sports are like any activity. They're good. Children love competition. But remember, there's all different levels of physical and emotional maturity. And it can be difficult um, to have your kids in like little league. You've got parents screaming and yelling at them and they could be the bullies. I know I've seen a lot of it um, where I live in South Florida. <clears throat> so making sure the parent understands what's going on during these sporting events and be in there to answer questions. They love to compete. Ever play a game with a young uh, school age child? They want to win. Dental health. Now, dental health um, helps with saving your teeth uh, so that they're not going to have pain and also that um, they don't get cavities. So they should brush their uh, teeth before going to bed. And they should floss, but kids under age seven do not have dexterity, the dexterity to do it. So parents need to do it for them. The one thing is that losing teeth can tell you something's not right. There's poor dental hygiene. So we need to prevent dental caries. And we know that dental cavities caries causes pain. 
So a kid is having pain in their mouth, it's not going to eat right and can cause periodontal disease too. Malocclusion, they're going to need braces. And then ever have a kid or know a kid who, let's say on the side of the pool, came down, the tooth hit, and the whole tooth fell off the front tooth. That's always the one that comes out. How do you save it? And do you save it? Well, yes, you can save it. We'll even save baby teeth that way, but we're more aggressive, of course, with the permanent tooth. If the parent or caregiver put it in cold milk, you can bring it to a pediatric dentist or a emergency room. They can numb the area and shove it back in. And then they'll be on a soft diet for several days. Now, if it's a permanent tooth, you can save your, those parents thousands of dollars by getting that tooth put back in, okay? So um, that would be what we would uh, hope could happen. So tell all the parents, the tooth falls out and you can see the whole root, put it in cold milk and bring it in. And why it's cold, why it's milk, I think the cold stops it from like rotting or progressing disease or the calcium in the milk. I'm not sure, but those are what I think of. And we also know that they break teeth, et cetera, et cetera. Sex education. Now they're getting curious now. In middle childhood is where we're going to be starting educating, you know, about um, going through puberty and reproduction. Um, we know that parents should have that good communication. Um, my parents would never talk to me until the day I got married, the day I was getting married. I didn't know, I, mean, I had to do it all myself, but I had six brothers. So no ever assume parents are going to tell children. So school nurses and, you know, nurses in doctor's offices, urgent cares and ERs can be a part of that education. You know, sex is, you know, uh, very normal. Children playing with themselves is very normal. Um, I know that the younger kids, they might sit there and play with their whatever out in front of people. You just say, listen, I don't want to watch you play in that thing here. Go in your bedroom by yourself. Do what you want there, but not in front of people. And that was all you would say. <clears throat> and always make sure you know what they know before you start teaching. So ask, you know, they're going to ask you questions as they get older. They're going to start wanting to know about uh, birth control um, into adolescence. You know, at this point, I mean, we could say, yeah, abstinence. They're not going to listen. So your opinion doesn't matter. It's give them proper information with written information. So let them know about the school nurse. Let them know about Planned Parenthood. Tell them to try to go to their parents. And they're going to say, I don't think so. That's what I would have said. So let them know, you know, what sex is. You know, it's when a male and a female, whatever you want to do and say, depend on the age, you know, and then sexuality is, you know, dressing like a girl, dressing like a boy, you know, and what do you do if you're in situations? You know, school nurse is a great, great profession for um, RNs that um, have children in school. You're going to be off all the holidays with them. And I think that's a great thing to have. It is a really interesting job. It's a community health job, isn't it? Because you're out in the community and you do a lot of health appraisals. Kids are sick or they're constantly sick, getting them proper uh, referrals, counseling to help them. Um, we know that they work a lot with, uh, you have children that get bacterial meningitis or remember when COVID hit, you know, all the information came home from the school nurse about what the uh, recent recommendations from CDC is. Bacterial meningitis, they're sent home. Listen, if your child, we believe they were exposed to this student who has, you know, meningitis, you need to go to your doctor to get a prophylactic antibiotic. You know, this is things that school nurses do. So the school nurses can be quite instrumental. Now, injury prevention, number one is what? Motor vehicle. Whether they're in the motor vehicle or ran over by the motor vehicle. So again, that stressful child, 
is going to be that risk factor for more injuries. Like I said earlier, you know, a kid who's in stress, are, they're not going to be as alert and they're going to maybe do things they might not have because they're just, they don't, they're stressed. <clears throat> they should be in the rear seat until they're 13 years old. My kids used to always call shotgun and they were nine and 10 years old, but we didn't know better then. They're better protected in the back seat. They should be in a booster seat until they're eight years old. They're, of course, in the rear facing on the first two years. In the middle of the car is what they want you to be. And then you turn it around, make sure there's a good uh, shoulder harness on that for them so that they're strapped in that harness there. <laughs> and at two, we turn it around and we put it front facing, but still in the middle of the car. That's what they recommend now. ATVs are great things. I live in South Florida by the Everglades. There's kids always on ATVs down here, running up and down one of the highways on the west side of, you know, down here in Homestead. Um, they should not be for children under 16 years old. I've seen many an ATV accident, and I'm going to tell you one about mono when we get to that section in a couple of weeks. The one thing we need to help to prevent injuries is using equipment, whatever you're using, doing equipment, you know, bicycles, wear helmets, skates, you're going to need gloves and knee pads and helmets, you know, scooters, um, trampolines, I would never put one in my backyard because I've seen too many accidents from them. And I guess I was right because it is one of those highest injuries. So they're really not recommended for any child of any age. So school age children are becoming more and more independent. Some parents have a hard time dealing with that. So you need to let the parents understand this is part of the normal process. Just to be there, be a parent, and to be aware of those forces of <laughs> maybe another kid being bullying, but to be there to listen. How was your day? How was your game today? How was, you know, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever. They need to be there, but sort of quietly, right? So we've gone from just the family, the constant in their life. Now they've got friends and they've got school and they've got activities. This is another part that is a part of their relationship now. Their mind's growing to other people. Now, ADHD is a big thing and you usually see it in the beginning of the school age. This is the kid who is totally distracted. I think the big word is distracted. These children, you go from one toy to the next, one chore from here to there, don't finish anything. They can't sit in school. They're disruptive of the classroom. And most of the time they're sent to the school nurse. I don't know what to do with this kid. Now, many people think that these kids are just spoiled and they don't listen but they really are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They don't know, their brain doesn't let them sit. So have the parents come in, do a conference, but first listen to what they've done for the child. They probably have done everything already. Many of them have. And then after you listen to their concerns, what they've tried, then make a plan, you know, and give them the proper resources that they need. <laughs> so the tooth fell out. You're going to the ER. Where do you put it? Cold milk. Yes, you do. Thank you. All right. Adolescents. You know, I call these the roller coaster kids. You just got to hold on because they're all over the place. I was a single parent by myself with a boy that was 17 months older than a girl. And I'm telling you, I just had to hold on for a roller coaster ride. And uh, I held on good because I've got two great kids that are amazing. And I'm a very proud mother. It was rough, very rough. So you've got a kid who is a child, right? And all of a sudden they're a teenager and how they're big boys and girls. And they want to do everything. They don't want to listen now, right? It is rapid physical, cognitive, social, and emotional maturation. 
again at that pre-adolescence, they're going to grow 20 to 25% of their whole um, height during two to three years. They're growing. You know, the boys are getting taller. They're getting hair on their face. They're getting a deeper voice. They're just growing. It starts at the beginning um, of puberty and it goes all the way uh, to about 18, 20 years old. <clears throat> so primary sex is what we need for reproduction. Secondary sex is all those things I mentioned, the hormones that are going on, the voice change, hair, the breast enlargements, you know, has nothing to do with reproduction, but it's all the way the body's changing to look more like a woman or in like a man. The first thing that we will see in a boy is testicular enlargement. Now, as mothers, we won't see those things, but we'll sort of assume that. Girls, the first pubescent change is breast buds. Of course, we'll be able to see that. And it's usually two years after that first initial scene of breast buds, that's when they're gonna start menstruation. So it's almost two years you have of all of this, you know, hormone going and the changes in the body. Many girls at the beginning, you know, at ages 12, 13, have very irregular menstrual cycles. There's a very large increase in height, like I told you, and of course, weight to keep up with the height, and they're moody, moody, moody. It's all the hormones. Remember that boys and girls around age 12, you can start about nine, but they say 12, they need that three dose series of HPV you know, so that they can prevent cervical cancer. And it is for boys too. Now, Tanner stages of development, you're gonna see this over and over again. This is one of those NCLEX questions. This is one of those HESI questions. They love Tanners. Just know about it that Tanner stage one, there's nothing. And stage five, they're completely mature. So there's stages in between and figuring out which one is which. Because you know, we start out with no boobs, we end up with boobs and genital hair on, on a girl. And you know, the, the menses. The boys start out with a small penis, small testicles, no hair, and they go all the way, everything enlarges and you have hair. And of course, the facial hair and the hormones and the height and weight and all that stuff too. So it's something you should look at even more closely. As I said, the adolescent growth spurt is in the very beginning. I have known that children, I've always said, you have a kid who's in eighth grade, take a picture of them the day they get off school in eighth grade. Over that summer, you are going to take a picture first day of ninth grade, and you're going to see amazing differences. I noticed it with my daughter because I happened to take a picture unknowingly and I saw it. All of a sudden she was this pudgy girl that went taller, um, became more mature. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. But that's what, 13 to 14, right there at that age. So 20 to 25% is our total height. Of course, weight goes with that. As I said, it's over two to three months. And sometimes you might see that a child might be pudgier if they get their menarche earlier. Boys don't have that sort of thing. And the voices do change in both sex, but more drastically in the man. I think in females, you might see it in the way they sing, could be a high soprano and an up an alto, you know, step down because of those voice changes. So it's normal. So Erickson, sense of identity. Well, when you think of identity, like, what do you think about? Well, who am I? You know, what do I look like? Body image is huge. You know, body image and not liking it can cause depression and suicide. That's how intense this body image and sense of identity can be. It goes further than that. Do I like girls? Do I like boys? Do I like both? What am I going to be when I grow up? What school am I going to go to? What group am I going to join of my peers? Is it the sports group? Is it the art club? Is it what? You know, you, all of these things are trying to figure out who am I? So 
as I said, with body image and depression, because it's a big thing. I'm too fat and too skinny, got too many freckles. My hair is too curly. I mean, everything can cause, you know, body image not to like. Any warning, warnings of suicide should be taken seriously. And some of those warnings could be not sleeping, being irritable as heck, not eating right or too much, and then not going out of the house. They might even start talking about, I'd be better off dead. Take it seriously. They need counseling. <clears throat> I mean, adolescents do commit suicide and that might be the only thing you see. So take it seriously. Even if they tell you your friend has said that, make sure their parents know, very important. So their social development, again, we know it's all about peers and being accepted, liking their body image. You know, they have gone from mostly listening to mom and mom's rules and what they do and being with mom and family. And now you're independent. You just want to be with your buddies and them, as I say. You know, you want to be at the park playing basketball or at the mall, you know, walking around or going to the movies or wherever they hang out today, you know, but they don't want any rules. They want to go when they want. They want the 20 bucks when they want. And it's not even 20 bucks now. Mom, I need 40. I mean, it used to be two bucks for me and I could get to the movies and get something to eat, but it's none of that stuff anymore. And this intense sociability, intense loneliness. So they are very social. They go to school, they're in clubs, they go and out and they hang out, dances and ball games and whatnot. But there is a lot of times when they're very, very lonely. This could happen with, let's say your best friend knows that you really like this guy and all of a sudden you come around the corner and your best friend's kissing the guy. You're like, now you've lost the best friend and the guy you liked. Intense loneliness. As I said, the relationship with parents is going to be changing. You know, it goes from complete dependency or most dependency to trying to work together as a team. It's really hard. It involves turmoil, ambiguity. I mean, it's, it's a hard, hard time of life. Children of adolescent age want all the privileges, but they're not always willing to accept the responsibilities. You have to take out the garbage, make your bed, get good on the exams, and then you could go out on Friday night, but be home at midnight. Well, they wanna come home at 2 a.m. Well, I think midnight's pretty decent you know, for a 16 year old, but they went out the 2 a.m. So it's all of this about independence and control, you know? So if we see that these adolescents are doing what they want, should be encouraged the parents sit down with the child together and compromise and set those limits and structures so the child knows what they have to do and responsibility to get the privileges they want. It doesn't always work, but it should be tried. Peers are the big people in their lives. So peers are the ones that give them that sense of belonging, feeling a strength and power. And now they're starting to be more independent and autonomous with the peers. They're best friends. Usually, again, it's still same sex. Doesn't mean that they are. But again, they usually do the same identity. If they're both in sports or they're both in art club or both in music, they usually will hang out together like that. And they care about each other. One of the things that is said about best friends, how a person treats their best friend as an adolescent is how they're gonna treat their partner for life. If they're considerate, they're courteous and caring, that's the way they'll be with their partner that they end up married to for life. Now, as a nurse, how are you gonna get a rapport with an adolescent? Remember, you're an adult, they don't wanna listen to you either, right? It's hard enough they're listening to mom and dad. Well, it's important for them to open up to you. So they walk in and you see earbuds. Hey, what music were you listening to? Or maybe you see, you know, a new style of Nikes or Adidas sneakers on them. Say, hey, I love your sneakers. Hey, can I ask you where you got those? Because my kid wants one. Something, breaking the ice, right? Or 
So have you decided your college yet? You know, you'll know which ones that you want to go to college or not. You can sort of, you know, get your way through that. Another thing is you're going to see some girls dressed more masculine and you're going to see some more males dressed more feminine. What you need to do is ask them what name they want to be called. Because the name on the chart may say Rachel, but they might want to be called Ray. And you know what you just did? You opened conversation. You've respected them enough to understand that there is a little difference and that you asked, it, what should I call you by? And let me tell you, they really appreciate it. Now, a lot of times, you know, adolescents come into the um, doctor's office and they have problems going on. Let's say frequent urinary tract infections on a girl. And we can sort of assume it probably could be something to do with sexual activity, right? Have the parent get out of the room, ask them to leave. And very quietly, we've already broken the ice. We've already asked these questions. We've got a good report going on and say, listen, tell me what, what's going on. Um, and they listen and they will try to shock you. Trust me, they do some things that I'm okay. Don't look shocked, just okay, okay. Now, in all of this information that they're telling you, again, any information they need must be given orally as an information and in written form, not what your feelings are, okay? So you're giving them what they need or going to, let's say it's all about sex and they need birth control, et cetera, going to Planned Parenthood. Or maybe the school nurse has some more information that I don't have that year. Or go to the internet to this website and you can find more information. <clears throat> Always suggest the school nurse with any problem they're having. Now, you get out of this little meeting and the mother wants to know what's going on. And I just say, I, I, you know, this is personal between me and your daughter. Um, there's nothing she's doing that's going to hurt herself or anybody else. So we've worked up a plan so that she can help take care of herself too. Because some mothers and fathers want to know what's going on. Now, remember that three-shot HPV series for that pre-cancer and cancers. Remember, it's not only for girls, it is for boys. Now, nutrition. Nutrition, nutrition. Adolescents are given some money to go to school, to eat school lunches. They tend to grab a bottle of water and a snack bar and go. They're busy all day long, barely eat. Sometimes they come home, they eat dinner, and that's their meal for the day. And a lot of times, there's going to be health issues. Make sure that if there are, ask for that 24-hour diary. Especially if that adolescent is fluctuating up and down, have them describe what their eating habits are, okay? Because a lot of times they don't want to spend their money also. They want to save it to do things they want to do. They should be sleeping as much as adolescents, but they don't. None of them do. And why? Well, they're busy with school, all of their activities and their friends, and they're on the phone, and they don't have time to go to sleep, okay? So can you imagine going through this adolescent, uh, pre-adolescent growth spurt, 20 to 25% of their total height? They should be eating well. Many of them don't. So there could be issues with that. So making sure adolescents understand that they do need proper nutrition and monitoring that height and weight as these children, remember, we do it from birth all the way up into adolescence, height and weight every visit we see them, just to keep a good control on it, making sure they're not getting too high or too low. They could become anorexic as adolescents because I'm too fat, I'm too fat, right? And of course, if they're getting exercise and of course, encourage dental health. Now, as I said, sexual education is rampant on TV. So it seems normal to jump into bed and have sex. I mean, it's all over the TV today. When I was a kid, it wasn't. I mean, I still remember I love Lucy way back. Uh, I think I was like five years old. And Lucy and Ricky slept in separate twin beds. And that was unbelievable. They showed a bedroom. 
on TV back in the early 60s. Can you imagine that? Look what's out there today. You're seeing a lot more skin and you're seeing a lot more, even the act of you know having sex you're seeing on TV, on regular TV. <laughs> so that sort of you know makes them more you know earlier to engage in sex. It, it's been shown. Again, where do we get information? Sex education, as I said, well, nurses, you're there if there's issues going on. Parents, if they'll go to them. And then school nurses should be there. And of course, recommending Planned Parenthood. Always motor vehicles, right? Now they're driving cars. So driving the cars, not in seat belts, and ran over by cars still. And then the second thing is firearms. They're like big enough now. They're going to pick up guns and try to play with them, you know, and they're going to shoot and it's not going to be pretty most of the time. Sports, they're competitive, right? They're going to want to play the best, but maybe them, some of them trying to get into a college, you know, getting some sort of um, tuition reimbursement for that, right? So um, maybe they haven't warmed up. Maybe they haven't worn proper protection. So injury prevention, teaching these things, very important. So you have a 14 year old. Remember at 14 is that pre-adolescent growth spurt, right? He's always eating, although his weight is appropriate for his height. The best explanation is what? <clears> hey. <throat> okay. Yeah, it's normal. It's pre-adolescent growth spurt. He's growing real tall then. He's keeping up eating because he's growing so quick, you know, and he's actually doing the right thing because he's still in proportion. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? Again, make sure you have your name and your campus in the um, chat box so that I can go back and I can review that, okay? <clears throat> so want to play some cahoots who wants, to, who wants to win today you know you got professor morris's class here you know they're going to try to beat you guys all right morgan and cameron i see you both uh, jacob's going to get you uh, he's already said it i saw him <laughs> so go to kahoot.it i love teaching with cahoots and this is actually your hesse review I do a cahoots. It's all I do. I don't give you a PowerPoint. I give you all the concepts you need in a cahoot. Now, this should be a good game today. All right, let's get going. And here we go. Week three, school age and adolescent children. How does the onset of the pubertal growth spurt compare in girls and boys? So remember about age 10, you start to see the beginning of puberty in girls and it's two years later at age 12 with boys. So I've always said when I was in fifth grade, boys were just stupid. They were silly, they were dumb. Multi-select, what activities are appropriate for a six-year-old child? Remember six, 
is school age, that is industry, things that they can do. Remember, they get very frustrated if they can't do things. So organized sports is just not enough yet. They're not old enough quite yet. Um, and the word is organized. It needs to be more of a play sport, not that organized like Little League. That's like older. Absolutely riding a bike, jumping a rope. Oh, for sure. What about hopscotch? I mean, that was a big thing I used to do at that age. You know, drawing chalk on the sidewalk and playing with it. And then play in solitary. They don't know how to do that yet. So that's above their heads. At what age should a parent expect to have major conflicts over independence and control with their child? Well, we know it's an adolescent. They're roller coaster ride ages. <laughs> And that's right in that middle, 15 to 17. I'm old enough to do what I want when I want. You can't tell me. And of course, it has to do with not listening to parents. And of course, it's fighting and conflict. And it's all about me, me, me at that age, right? Signs of the onset of puberty in girls. It's the first thing you see or hear. So the first thing you see in girls is developmental of those little breast buds. And then you'll see the other things. And if you go back and refer to stages, uh, Tanner stages um, really shows you it very clearly. The onset of puberty in boys is characterized by. I mean, we know all of those things happen there, but what's the number one? <clears throat> And that's testicular enlargement. That's number one. Now, all this stuff happens, but number one is the testicles get longer, you know, wider, uh, reddened, and that's what boys do. What do we use to determine if a female has reached an age of menarch? So when we're looking at ages of menarche and puberty in boys or girls, go back and refer to those Tanner stages. It really will show you, are they there yet? Or are they before that? A child goes to ER with low fever, puritic rashes, and open oozing papules. Nursing care includes, well, when you see a child with these sort of symptoms, where does your mind go? What do you need to do to protect yourself? What could this be? This is probably chicken pox, varicella, okay? Especially those oozy papulas. So you need, it's respiratory. And even if you've been immunized for the varicella, with the varicella vaccine for chickenpox, you know, you still can get it. So you need to protect yourself, number one, N95 mask. Also, if they're admitted into a hospital, all the rooms, airs flow into the next room, except for what we call negative pressure rooms. That air goes outside, it's filtered and gone outside. So it can't infect the entire hospital. Now, what do we give a child with varicella? Well, it's a virus. So we're gonna give a cyclovir, right? A vir, V-I-R is for antiviral. 
And what does acyclovir do? Well, it doesn't cure it, but it decreases the amount of papules you see. So it will be shorter of an outcome. It doesn't take as long for it all to heal because there'll be less oozing papules because you cannot be out in public until they're dried and crust over. The source of injury, whether intentional or unintentional in adolescence, is associated with what? <clears throat> And that's your motor vehicle accidents, absolutely. You know, you're, you see there drowning. Remember, we always should include water safety in our you know, injury protection, absolutely for sure. But unintentional injuries are um, motor vehicle, either in it or ran over by it. A parent feels uncomfortable about talking about sex education. So who is a good resource? And that's your school nurse. School nurse is a great resource. They usually have all information and brochures and stuff to give students that they need. A nine-year-old friend tells him soccer is a dumb game and he should play baseball. Why are they saying that? So we know the peer acceptance is huge, same-sex peers, and many times they'll change their likes to a different game or a different group, organization, whatever, just to be with their peer. They do do it. It's not uncommon at all. During admission, the father of a 16-year-old says, we are Buddhist. Culturally competent care includes what? You know, you'll see me throw some questions from weeks before into these um, cahoots just to keep you understanding uh, some of these concepts. Like do growth and development, something like this. So we know um, if somebody is of a different culture that we don't understand, the best thing is to ask. And remember, you can ask the child themselves not just the parents, a 16 year old has their own opinions. You can talk to them too. When teaching sex education and contraceptive for adolescents, what should the nurse consider? <coughs> <coughs> Again, give them education by mouth, orally, and in written form. You know, the sexual activity, contraceptives, the replanning. Well, they're coming to you for education. So just give them the information, and then they can make their plan, you know, with you or their school nurse or Planned Parenthood, whatever they need. A multi-select. The management of adolescent obesity should include what? So you have an adolescent who's overweight, needs to go on a diet. All right, number one, you're going to do that 24 hour diary. I want to know what they're eating, you know, on a daily basis. Always put some of their favorite foods in there. You know, like on Sundays, you can have a little bowl of ice cream if that's what they like. Diversional activities is more for your younger kids. Diversion is usually preschoolers and toddlers. 
And then nutritious food, they don't want nutritious food. They, they want the junk food. So nutritious food is not a reward, okay? Infants go through predictable sequence of growth and development. This is called what? And it's called sequential trends. It's sort of a trick question, right? Sequence of growth. And it means they lift their head up first and then they roll from belly to back and back to belly. And then they're on their knees and they're crawling and creeping and walking. This is all that predictable sequence. Doesn't mean they go through every single step, but it means they're moving forward in that sequence. Which benchmark serves as an ending period for school age children? <clears throat> And it's the onset of puberty or all of their uh, permanent teeth are in. What action would improve dental health in the school age child? So you want them to floss their teeth, but remember um, up to about the age of seven, they don't have that dexterity to do it. So not all school age children can floss by themselves. They may need someone to do it for them. Generally, the earliest age at which puberty begins is what? <clears throat> It's 10 and girls, 12 and boys. Very good. Yes. <clears throat> An eight year old girl says she has cancer because God is punishing her for being bad. Why is she saying that? absolute common belief for children. They believe that they hit the sister or they didn't do what mommy wanted, that they're being punished, whether it's a broken bone, being sick, uh, an appendix. This is absolutely a common belief. A six-year-old needs to get a chest x-ray. What explanation is best? <clears throat> <clears throat> again it's a big camera i'm going to look at the insides you know these children think that there's gamma radiation rays that have come out and going to burn holes in them and they've got these incredible imaginations and watch too many cartoons and tv shows so that is the best explanation and it's less threatening for them how do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? Yeah, start telling me about your social life. You know, what music do you listen to? What do you want to be in school? You know, what do you like to do for fun? All of those things. 
you've calmed them down. It's like getting on their developmental level of the younger children. And then they will, they'll start talking to you. And again, be prepared. They're going to try to shock you. How can you get an adolescent to be more receptive to talking about their health and sexual explorations? Have the parents leave the room. And remember, you do not have to tell the parents what they said unless what they told you could hurt themselves or others, okay? Besides that, you don't have to tell them. Then confidence. Multi-select. When educating adolescents about the risk for HIV and hepatitis, what would you include? <clears throat> So you're going to tell them abstinence is what you tell them all. I mean, we know they're going to do what they want, but condoms, at least if they're going to have sexual intercourse and then always hand washing. That's always part of infection control. Very good. I hope they take a shower more than once a week. A child has a knocked out tooth. Where should the tooth be placed for transport to the dentist? You put it in cold milk and you bring it in. And I've seen many a tooth be able to reattach. So it does work. And they numb it with um, a numbing um, cream that they put on the tooth and they let it sit for quite a while. And the dentist comes and shoves it in there, holds it there for a little bit. And then they have like a very soft diet and are checked in a couple of days at the dentist. A nurse planning for care for a school-aged child should know which thought process is seen. School-age children, what did I tell you about them? <laughs> it's that ability to conserve. Magical thinking is your preschoolers. They sit there and talk to each other. And is, and is, um, is when they take a broom and ride it like a horse. They use inanimate objects and make it into some sort of animal, okay? Thoughts are all powerful. That's not till adolescence. That's really later on. But they know that if they have water and it's tall, skinny, and a short fat, there's still the same amount of water, okay? That is that ability to conserve what that means. What stage of Erickson would you use for a school-age child? And it's industry versus inferiority. Remember, industry is the task they do well. Inferiority is what they can't do, whether they can run fast and then they're no good at spelling, inferiority. That's what Erickson means, doing stuff well or they can't. I'm feeling bad about it. School age children's moral development. <clears throat> so at school age they conform to the rules to please everybody else it's right and wrong the behaviors are more preschool they understand that but it goes further than that now now they know what is the good stuff 
And they're going to do that good stuff because they want to please. They want people to say, wow, they are really well behaved. Little bit more than just good and bad. A multi-select. Anorexia nervosa is a characterized by <clears throat> And I can't cover everything within a PowerPoint. <clears throat> so sometimes I'll take it, I'll put it in a cahoots to be able to describe it to you. So anorexia nervosa is when they're afraid to put anything in their mouth because it's going to gain weight. So it's this fear of weight gain, severe, severe calorie restriction, might be a piece of lettuce and water for the day. And they have these unrealistic body image. They think they're fat when they're very, very skinny. Now, there's another one called bulimia. Bulimia, they eat everything in the house and they throw it up. So what would you see in the difference? They're both going to be skinny because they're both not getting nutrition. But the one who's bulimic with vomiting and purging, that stomach acid is going to rot their teeth. So if you have had a child, an adolescent, long-term doing bulimia or anorexia, look at their teeth. You'll be able to see the difference with the teeth. And how do you know if you suffer from bulimia? <clears throat> And that's that binge eating and purging behavior. Stomach acid comes up and rots the teeth, absolutely. And they eat incredible amounts of food and just purge, purge, purge. A lot of times they have buckets of it everywhere. Adolescents are. There's somewhere between a kid and an adult, and they're confused, trouble, and frustrated. Body image, identity, right? So answers one and two. What is an adolescent's heart rate? <clears throat> In the first day of class, I gave you the vital signs for you know all sorts of ages. They're they're like not exacting they're just these you know basic limits averages now adolescents are younger their hearts are usually more efficient so it's 55 to 90. if we're talking 40 85 that's a little too low 55 to 105 something's going on there whether it is a maybe a fever, dehydrated, pain, something. And of course, 120 is way too high. Fever, dehydrated, or pain's going on. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? The biggest thing is to give them that moment to be able to talk to you, to express their feelings, and to be able to be open and honest. As I said, sometimes their honesty will shock you, but allowing them to talk about it sometimes is what they do need to do. A parent says the infant puts everything in their mouth. Based on Freud's theory, you would respond, what? Like, why do they do that, right?
So the infants explore the world in their mouth, sensor motor, motor, which is what it feels like, what it's in the mouth and how to move it. It's all about exploring the world through their mouths. It's also their mouths are what they self-soothe with, whether a pacifier, a finger, a thumb, a hand, whatever it is, that's how they self-soothe too. A multi-select. What could be a sign of potential child abuse? <clears throat> so there's going to be inconsistencies between the injuries and what they're telling you. Also, sometimes the child won't talk because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong things because they're afraid of the mother and the, or the father. Also, there's different stories, which is that inconsistency. Now, sometimes that child abuse was not from the parents. Remember, those parents are going through a traumatic time too. So at that time, you're dealing with two patients, the parents and the child. Let's say it was the uncle or the nephew or the next door neighbor or something. Make sure that, you know, that parent knows that you're there for them too. In addition to injuries, the leading cause of death in adolescents ages 15 to 19 are... So we know always it's motor, uh, motor vehicles, but then it's uh, that homicide and it's suicide. Remember body image and that depression. And there is a lot of suicide in adolescence. Take it seriously. So in school age, conflict of industry versus inferiority. What does industry mean? And that's mastering a task. What do I do well? Do I write well? Do I spell well? Do I run the fastest and I hit the ball the farthest? What do I do well? And then inferiority is what I can't do well. So I do something great and some things I can't do as good as I'd like. Which age group prefers to be with members of their own sex? And these are your older school age children, kissing adolescents and they're, yes, they do want to be same sex, but there's also more peer groups are males and females. So it is the older school age children. True or false, home support is invaluable to the adolescents. They need mom and dad. And the answer is yes. I mean, what if the child, is, the adolescent is out there, something happens that was devastating. They need a mom and dad to go home to, to be hugged or to talk to. They still need that. They still need mom and dad to be there when they need them. They don't want them all the time, but there are these times where that home support is invaluable. What clinical finding does not indicate an adolescent may be suffering from anorexia nervosa? <clears throat> So 
So the one that's not anorexia nervosa is bulimia. And what you see in bulimia is that decaying teeth, that cavities due to the stomach acid. Dry skin and tolerance to cold constipation are all due to chemical imbalances. It also looks like hypothyroidism. Those are all three symptoms of that also. A 14 year old in the emergency room after a biking accident. How should the nurse interact with this adolescent? Now many time with a biking accident, they've been hit by a motor vehicle and they're rushed in by ambulance or on a, on a helicopter. And they're brought in and people are running at them doing 16 things at once. You're now the primary nurse. You need to be at the head of the bed and you need to be providing clear explanations what's going on because they're touching them all over. They're cutting clothes off, starting IVs, taking x-rays, listening to their chest, their bellies, looking at their eyes and they're like, what's going on? And you have parents usually that are right outside the door who are yelling to get to their child too. So you as that primary nurse giving those clear explanations, making sure you answer the questions that they need, you've got the kid calm. Well, what if they had a big laceration that was bleeding? You've calmed them down. Heart rate went down, blood pressure went down. And what have you done? You've decreased the amount of bleeding that's going on, haven't you? Very important nursing role. I loved being primary trauma nurse. It was a lot of fun for me. I actually had one gunshot wound to the abdomen. That was fun. Cooperative play. <clears throat> so we have all sorts of play, parallel play, solitary play, associative play, cooperative play. Cooperative play is which one? That's when you have a goal. Right? That's the one that you know that they're going to either build that tower or play checkers together if they're older. Associative playing together, but not with a goal. Parallel play, perfect for your um, preschooler toddlers. They play next to each other, but not with each other. Playing together to uh, each other next to, but not with the same toys. And of course, solitary, you know, is when they're on their own alone. What does moral development involve? <clears throat> you know, that's Kohlberg, right? The theory is Kohlberg. What, do, what does he talk about? So we know that the moral uh, development's all about Changes in thoughts regarding right and wrong and the consequences from either of them. Very good. And we know as they get into school age is knowing what's right and wrong and doing the right thing because they like to please others. Developmental milestones are important to observe because what? Again, this is a question about really your younger children. But it does go into, you know, the school age, too, because if they're not developing right, what's going on? Is it stresses at home? We know that if you have um, something that you're delayed, that we can give early intervention. Children are great. They catch up so quickly. But as long as you have instituted early intervention, and it could be speech, physical, or occupational therapy, and we get it going, and these children catch up really quick. That's why I love children. They're so resilient. Lymph nodes in children with normal findings. <clears throat> They're not sick. shouldn't be able to feel them at all. They shouldn't be there. If the kid's not sick, they should be unable to palpate. Feel it, maybe it's a cancer, right? But usually no, like Hodgkin's lymphoma, you might have one there, they're not sick, 
It's a cancer, but again, that means they're sick, right? Depriving a child of food and clothing and shelter is called what? <clears throat> and it's called neglect. You know, I saw on the news, it was actually two different times I saw Two young kids, ages like six and eight, were outside. It was 30 some odd degrees. And they're playing with a ball in the front yard. It went in the street and they were slightly hit by a car. Not a big injury, but, you know, enough that the police were called. And the parents were arrested for neglect because they both didn't have coats on because it was 30 something. So it can happen. So, you know, that is the definition. Which of the following immunizations is given in the adolescent stage? And that's the HPV series. It's a three series that they do give. Again, it is for boys and girls. And by the time they're adolescents, time injections will go into the deltoid. You know, as they're younger, it's in their vastus lateris um, and or in the, you know, the Botox for adolescents, but they can get it in the deltoid, most of them. ADHD most likely involves which of the following? So it's that inattention, distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. They can't sit and they're always moving and they're distracted very easily. Very good. A multi-select. An adolescent has been brought to the ER with a drug overdose. What are the initial questions you need to ask? This means the adolescent's talking at least. So I want to know the type of drug, when they took them, and then how do they take it? I mean, if they, you know, cocaine, they're just sniffing it in their nose. Okay. But what if now they're giving it IV? You know, that means they have progressed to a larger, you know, um, addiction here. So understanding these things can help you treat them. Rehab, they're not thinking of rehab yet. First thing that you need to treat what's going on right now and get them safe. And last question, adolescents typically place blank on peer relationships. Remember peers are the ones that do the same thing. They are boys and they are girls at this point. <clears throat> And absolutely high value. They want their peers. They want that acceptability. They want their identity seen. So here we go. Number three, WJ. Number two, IC. And number one, Naona. Bogart's class. We did it. JM and Brittany. So those from Professor Morris's class. Did you enjoy your cahoots in class? Yeah, it was really helpful. Yes, it was. I did, but I think the placement was rigged. <laughs> <laughs> I it was a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> we rigged it. Okay, both of you do have your quizzes already um, loaded in your uh, Canvas. Go to your modules. Go to quiz two. Do you need a moment of studying for a moment? 
Remember I told you it's a lot from last week. I can give you 10 minutes or you can do it now, but I need, you know, everybody doing it together. Can we take a bathroom break real quick? All right, five o'clock and I'm gonna wait here for you. So don't open it yet. Perfect. Um, mine says it's locked until five. Well, we'll be back at five and it'll be perfect. Was that you, Olivia? Who said that? Um, I did, Ashley. Okay. I'm in Morris's class. Okay, yeah, because I did it for five for her. Okay. I'll make sure you're good. Thank goodness I have access. And make sure if you're from Professor Morris's class, I have your name and campus in the chat box, please. I think I have all of your names here, correct? She's always good that way to make sure your names are right. Professor Bogart, are we starting now the quiz? I, I couldn't hear you. We're waiting till five o'clock. Oh, they okay. wanted a quick break to go to the bathroom, to review last week's PowerPoint, just to see what was going on, to give them refresh, because it's information from last week. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
I'm assuming you're having us stay on here and not log on to a secondary while we take the quiz. No, you're staying right here. Okay. So they've decided, uh, the pediatric team, we're gonna be giving the quizzes, all of them at the end of class. Instead of coming in prepared, ready to take a quiz immediately, we decided as a team to do it all at the end. So at least you have um, the information from the day. Most quizzes are based on the week you are in because infant toddlers have so much information we had two quizzes on them.
Okay, it's five o'clock. It's time to start the quiz. Just to remind you, you have Burns case study due this week, and you also have 50 and Clex questions. Make sure you follow the modules on what is due. It is growth and development, the first set. It's not under pediatrics, it's another section, and it is 50 questions, okay? So go ahead, start your quiz too, and I wish you good luck when you're done. We are finished with class. Nice meeting all of you from the other class. It was nice meeting you too. Thank you. And good luck, everybody. Thank you. Okay, everybody quiet now so we can concentrate.
progress.